Bobby Fish and Adam Cole versus Orange Cassidy and Wheeler Yuta. Wheeler Yuta, much like Brian in the very first match I ever saw him in, going with the tights tucked into tennis shoes look. Mm. Never yeah, a good tragedy. one. Never a good one. Get some boots or kick I did that in something. fucking 1998, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is 2021, buddy. Yeah. It was funny because a couple of weeks ago, JR was all over him on his tennis shoes. And turns out they're shooter boots. They're just white. Hmm. And if you look, Orange Cassidy's wearing the exact same shoes. Chris is wearing jeans. That's true. So you can't tell. It's the tights tucked into the shoes is the biggest deal. Right. It, it, it's, it's not flattering for anyone. No. So they essentially here. Yeah, they made the comment that, like, you know, those are the same shoes that uh, so and so won an Olympic gold medal in wrestling with. Right. And I was like, well, that guy wasn't wearing pants. <laughs> well, he's right. Minoru Suzuki basically wears tennis shoes. They look fine. He's well, not yeah, wearing tights tucked into them. Exactly. Don't, you know what's worse than tucking your tights into your boots? What's that? Wearing your knee pads under those tights. <laughs> That's right? true. Wheeler Yuta was not like doing that. I fucking olive oil. <laughs> Wheeler Yuta was not doing that. So the first part of this match, I mean this as a compliment, they basically had a house show match. Yeah, they did. Because Adam Cole wanted to just call himself Adam Cole Bebe. Mm-hmm. And Orange Cassidy wanted to put his hands in his pockets, but Adam Cole wouldn't let him. And it just played off this for like four minutes, and it was awesome. We don't have the quarters yet, and it doesn't matter because the show aired the day after Thanksgiving, and it's going to fucking die. Yep. Same with Dynamite. But uh, it would be interesting to see the quarter hours for uh, Orange Cassidy house show spots, because when you see Orange Cassidy at house show, it's fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. But the argument always is, that shit ain't going to work on national television. But I watched on national television, and I enjoyed it, but I'm me. So I wonder, does your average person watching this, I mean, is that true? Everyone always said that, but you can say whatever you want. Is it true? Can you not do these goofy house show spots on national television? Or do people watching on national television find it just as entertaining as when people go to house shows? I don't know so, the answer. So with, with my family, my son always wants to know when Orange Cassidy is on. And he will stop what he's doing if he's not watching already. And he will make a point to come see what Orange Cassidy was doing. Followed behind him is my wife because she is wildly entertained by him. So there's a very, very small sample section. So we get the Orange Cassidy hot tag, which is when he really cranks up the comedy. It's his usual shtick, but even more because there's two guys to work with in there. And then eventually the wrestling kicks in. It's very, very good wrestling. I do think it went a little too long. There are points where they lost the crowd, but they were able to get him back in there. You could tell, last two times we've seen Wheeler Yuta wrestle a match, he was destroyed. Once by John Moxley, and I forget who the second one was, but they wanted to rehabilitate him a little bit here. He got a lot of offense, got a lot of near falls, but eventually Cole takes out Orange, throws him into the stairs, and Bobby Fish pins Wheeler with an avalanche Falcon Arrow. Holy shit, what a move that was. <laughs> Jiminy Christmas. That guy's 45 fucking years old. Yes. You think I'm jumping off the top rope and landing on my ass? A bad, seems like a bad idea to me. But he did it, and he pinned poor Wheeler. Who made fun of Wheeler's name on the show? Bobby Fish. It was Bobby Fish, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now he can do it twice. Bobby Fish. Yes, Bob, that was... Made the, fun of Wheeler. It was Yuda, to be fair. He was making fun no, of he was yelling at the parents. He said, what kind of a name is Yuda? Well, I know, but, I mean, he screwed it up. What kind of a name is Wheeler? What kind of a name is Fish? He, well, he blamed his parents for naming him Yuda, but that's like their, that would be their family name. That's he should name. blame them for, for the Wheeler part. I see. Yeah. What is a Wheeler? Dealer. What's his real name? I once asked somebody, and, and it was like... It's probably his real name. <laughs> no, it was his real name was even weirder than Wheeler Yuda, if I recall correctly. Weirder than Wheeler? Yeah. Wow. What a world. I don't know what his real name is. Wacky. (laughs) Well, anyway, Tony Schiavone interviews Tony Nese. Yes, Tony Nese, who's been in the crowd forever, is now, they've let us know he's actually signed. Mm -hmm. He says he has been scouting talent. He wants to take advantage of the open door, the forbidden door debut in all elite wrestling by winning the TNT championship. Says if Ethan Page, if Bobby Fish, if Jay Lethal had done their homework like he has, Sammy Guevara wouldn't be champion right now. Because I've been watching Sammy as TNT champion, and I have to say, I am unimpressed. And apparently, Sammy Guevara was 
three feet away, watching the entire time, and waited for that insult to come before he stepped in, because he zips in off screen. They go back and forth, and Tony says, fine, I challenge you next week. And Sammy accepts, and they shake hands, but then he cheap shots him and lays him out and threatens to see him next week. This was not well acted. I thought it was pretty bad. Actually, I I, I, I don't want to say that it was like really good, but I did not think it was bad. And whenever we, have, you know, the the signing of uh, what's his name, Tony Nice, Tony Nice, <laughs> signing of Tony Nice was somewhat controversial because we were like, man, they got rid of all these guys who signed Tony Nice because like the the story on Tony Nice was really good wrestler but no personality whatsoever. That's yeah. what people said. Yeah. And uh, he did not show a lack of personality in this promo. I wouldn't say that it was a great promo, because when you watch AEW, there are legitimately great promos. Like, we just talked about CM Punk and MGF. This was nowhere in that, in that no. universe. No, it was not. But you know what? It wasn't bad. It was very adequate. It was, it was fine. It was adequate. And, and, uh, and perhaps with, with uh, more time, they will even be good. Sure. But to... to, to, to Kind of get on a guy for not having good promos when he was a 205 live guy and never allowed to talk anyway. I don't know if the guy's any good or not. And he was fine here. Do you say so? He was fine. Well, you know who's a good promo is FTR. Craig doesn't watch Raw, so he's got this... <laughs> you, you actually just watch NXT 2.0? You're going to tell me Tony needs a bad promo? Oh, I've got lots to say about okay, that. Okay, that's what I thought. Well, FTR got a promo about be- being living Lucha Legends... And they are challenging the Lucha Brothers to a two out of three falls match, which I think I'll book for Dynamite by the end of the show. So we have Riho versus Britt Baker. This is the match where if Riho wins, she gets a title shot. And they're doing this match. And you mentioned, Brian, it was the day after Thanksgiving. It's Black Friday. People are still on vacation. Viewership's going to die. Nobody's watching. And it really, really felt like they punted this show. Like, th- there are stars. Adam Cole is a star. Britt Baker's a star. Eddie Kingston's a star. But. It felt like none of these matches had any stakes. They were gonna have some. We're gonna watch it and have fun. But if you miss it, you're fine. Well, this one had big stakes. Well, it. I didn't think Rio had a chance in hell. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> so <laughs> why a non-title match where if she won, she got a title shot? You thought she, she had well, no chance because Britt Where's Baker never been? loses. Well, that's true, but that's the point. Well, that they they I I didn't think she was gonna lose. Where's Rio been? This is like. First time she's been on TV in months. And probably travel issues. Since that Battle Royal, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they, they did not do a good job of building, making Riho seem like a credible threat. They just said she can get a match. Now, the match is not bad. It's fine. But um, I, I went off on, uh, not a rant, but I was typing things about how, man, this this is a B-minus Rampage show. And I'm, I'm writing about how unimportant and missable it is. And then Riho wins <laughs> with a roll-up out of nowhere. What? Bro. <laughs> You're fucking out to lunch. I watched this match, and for the first, I would say, uh, I think eight minutes of it aired on television. There was a full four-minute commercial, so they had 12 minutes. Okay. And, you know, the first, I don't know, three, four minutes, it was just there for me. But I thought that by the end, it turned into, like, a good match. And I was not surprised. I would have been stunned if Britt Baker would have be- beat Riho under these these circumstances here. They need a challenger. I mean, they got to do something. They got Winter is coming. They got Battle of the Belts. Who's Britt Baker going to face? They got to make some challenger. So I wasn't surprised at all that she won. And I th- what I liked about it was we see these fucking uh, championship contender matches, I think they call them on WWE, because you can't say, like, number one contender or title or belt or anything so they gotta fucking jump deep into the thesaurus to come up with some fucking opportunity on a pole but anyway when they do that it's like you know three minute match somebody interferes champ gets fucked and then you gotta match okay this was not this like they worked this match like it was an important match whether you thought it was or not okay is irrelevant fair they went 12 minutes and they had a back and forth match and and rio pinned her and my favorite part of the match, of all things, because I like the little things, is when Britt Baker got cradled. I can't even really explain what happened, but, like, the best way I could explain it was it looked like her weight was on her left shoulder, and so she should have tried to roll her right shoulder, but she tried to roll her left shoulder, and it didn't work, and she got pinned. Wow. There was something about the finish where it was like, 
she convinced me that she was really trying to kick out, mm -hmm. but she did it in time. And she got pinned. And then she was all angry about it. And Rio was all happy. And we had a contender. And, like, she hadn't lost in forever, so it felt meaningful. I liked this. It definitely was a meaningful win. Yes. So I did the research. I looked up the last time Britt Baker lost a singles match on television. It was in March. And it was the Lights Out match against Thunder Rosa, which means technically it never happened. Yeah. So the last singles loss she had that counted on television Nyla Rose on Dynamite in February. Yeah. It's been almost a year. Yeah, and I think that was the one that she... Uh, didn't she blame Aubrey for that one? It was I'm a probably, long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yes. Well, she, she, she has a habit of when she loses blaming others. I'm sure she blamed Aubrey or Reba or Tony or somebody. I, I did like it that they... Um... They they went ahead with the storyline that Jamie Hayter and Britt are on the outs. And this one was very subtle. When they were coming down the ramp, they introduced Britt. And then the other two girls are supposed to run out. But Jamie took her sweet time. And Britt looks to her left. Or looks to her right, excuse me. And there's Rebel. And she looks to her right. And Jamie's not there yet. Because she's taking her sweet time getting there. And Britt rolls her eyes. And then they get to the ring, and after the after the match, uh, there's there's more tension between them. So there could be one of your next matches as well. Dynamite this week: Cody versus Andrade in a street fight. Chris Tatlander versus Ruby Soho in the TBS tournament match. Brian Danielson versus Allen Angels, and the Gun Club versus Sting and Darby Allen. Yeah. And then Rampage on Friday, Tony Nese versus Sammy Guevara for the TNT title, and the Lucha Brothers versus FTR, two out of three falls. So Mark Henry interviews, of course, Eddie Kingston and Daniel Garcia in 2.0. 2.0 are so great at being over-the-top, pro-wrestling, bottom-of-the-card geeks. And that's not a knock. Love them. They're fantastic. They're wonderful in this role. They do their thing. It's great. Eddie is laughing at them, claiming when, when they say they're going to embarrass him. He laughs them off, and then his response is just telling them to shut up, and he walks away. And then Mark Henry says, it's time for the main event. So it's Daniel Garcia versus Eddie Kingston. Best match on the show. Uh, well, yes. A of, fucking yeah. battle. Of the three, it was a battle. It was a battle, and it was a thinking man's match, because... They're having, it's just a fight early. Just all brawling, and Eddie's fighting dirty. He's doing eye pokes. He's biting. He's just being a complete dick. But somewhere in here, he ends up hurting his knee. And it hurts really bad. He can't even run when he's whipped into the corners. He just collapses on the mat. He is still able to throw some suplexes, but he, he's a, he is a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. And Garcia is a shooter. And he keeps going for submissions. And Eddie Kingston's a tough dude. And he's been around the block. And, and, he, and he can take care of himself. But he is not trained in this mat game. He's, he, is, he is at a disadvantage here. And every time he gets put into a submission, he, uh, he has to get the ropes. He can't counter his way out of it. He's not going to out-wrestle Daniel Garcia. But what Eddie Kingston is, is a wily veteran. And he is able to dictate the match. He gets Garcia out of his game plan. Garcia gives up on the mat game, which he was doing so well at, to exchange strikes instead. He's beaten at that game. He's suplexed onto his head repeatedly. Uh, Excalibur notes, those kind of suplexes where your chin touches your chest are the worst. Ricky Stark's deadpans. Trust me, Excalibur, I know. And eventually, uh, they're having a strike exchange, and Eddie hits one last suplex, and he gets the back fist, and he wins. I think he actually missed one, but then just followed through with another one and clobbered him. It was a smart match by Eddie Kingston to get the youngster out of his game plan. I love this match. Yeah, this match was great, and uh, Eddie Kingston is, is is such a... He is so good at playing his character. Mm -hmm. His selling, his his uh, his brawling, his everything that he does is great, and... Uh, I don't. Uh, Daniel Garcia is is uh, he's he's their newest young guy. He's going to do a million jobs, but he's slowly going to keep getting main events, and he's going to start winning slowly. And in two years, he's going to be a big star if he can talk. He doesn't really do a lot of promos yet. Uh, that's two point is for right. But now. he's got two point mm -hmm. Yes, so mm -hmm. I thought this was just a, a great match. Too bad it aired on Thanksgiving, so like a lot of people didn't see it, okay. uh, but uh, it was great. Yeah, the. Um... Both guys wrestled their match. That was that was cool. Um, I love it. Eddie would just get 
frustrated with the guy because the guy would keep going after his leg and he would just the guy would go for his leg and they'd be in the corner and Eddie would just smack him in the back just chop him yeah. in the back and then when all else fails he would just chop him in the chest chop him in the side just slap him as hard as he could it just Eddie Kingston is so different from any other wrestler and he's fantastic at being Eddie Kingston yes when all of your wrestlers come out of the cookie cutter machine and they do the exact same match. Exactly. You can't do stuff like this. When wrestlers are allowed to develop and uh, uh, use free will to, to uh, uh, accentuate their own strengths and weaknesses, you can tell stories like this in the ring. It's great fun. It's like Eddie Kingston is not a gimmick. He uh, doesn't no. Have, <laughs> he doesn't have a gimmick. He's just Eddie Kingston. Yes. So afterwards, 2.0 attacks Eddie, and who should make the save from the commentary desk but Chris Jericho? So there's perhaps something to bring with Jericho and Eddie, which is well, we had we had an angle on on uh, Dynamite. We had the angle here. So yes, I would say Vinny, that something for sure is brewing. And Jericho with Eddie and Jericho has been admiring this Kingston fella from afar. And well, you know I he's mean, a he's a big star, and he needs something to do. And Moxley is gone. And the two of them can team and have great matches. And sure. And I think that uh, it's a great thing to do for the moment. Sure. Again, maybe it's just that as a Canadian who has always had health insurance, this doesn't seem, Max, smart enough to this, be a big this deal. This is going to go to the best of right here, Lance. Yeah. You were being corralled away by uh, by this dog. By a dog trying to eat my wife's uh, boots. Oh, man. Oh, they said they must be tasty. Yeah, if my wife gets home and her good leather boots are chewed up, I'm dead. You'll be chewed up next. Yeah, I'll be living outside with the dog. If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.